then. Great pleasure to be here. I actually flew in this thing once, a long time ago. It was very expensive, <laughs> but it was an experience. You know, I'm really excited about technology. I've been uh, for a long time talking about the future of technology. I used to be in the music business as a musician and producer, and then in the 90s, I went on the internet. I did about a dozen startups in digital music. One of them was trying to do what today is Spotify. Right? And we were just slightly early. That was about 2001, and we spent $25 million finding out that we were too early. Uh, but it was a good lesson. <laughs> and uh, so the last 15 years, I've been speaking about the future. And it's interesting, about three years ago, four years ago, I started to get a lot of pushback from people saying, you know, grad technology is great, you know, all this technology all the time, everybody's a technologist, everybody's a data scientist. But what's going to happen to people when technology is everything? When technology actually is creating people, right? So that inspired me to write this book, Technology Versus Humanity. And it was funny, you know, when I started uh, working on the book, it was actually 2016, my publisher said, you can't call this technology and humanity. That was my title, right? My, the publisher and their wisdom, I, I later on fired them, but in their wisdom, they, they decided, you know, it should be versus humanity. I'm like, no, 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 that's not true. It's and humanity. Right? So that's become my key topic. That's what I want to talk to you guys about today. Uh, as a futurist, I'm actually not involved with predictions. You know, I'm, I do observations. I work on foresights, intuition, imagination. There are futurists who are great at predicting, Ray Kurzweil, Alvin Toffler, of course, Arthur C. Clarke. You know, those are the Jimi Hendrix of futurism. <laughs> That's not really me. But I try to observe and create some foresights. So I'm going to share some of those with you today. Uh, most importantly, I think right off the top, uh, my view really is that technology is not what we seek, but it's how we seek. Technology is a tool, a very, very powerful tool. And technology can always be used for good or bad things. You know? The television, people are addicted to television, right? Now they're addicted to Facebook. Right? Technology is morally neutral until we use it. William Gibson, right? one of my favorite science fiction authors. That's something to keep in mind when we talk about technology. It's not about saying yes or no, it's good or bad. There's no such thing. Technology just is, right? and of course, we create it. Right? So we have to think about our context. Hence the title of my talk, The Next 10 Years. Let's start with this. It's, it's hard to imagine, right? But if you, if you look back 10 years ago, our world was a little bit different. You know, we didn't have free phone calls like we have today. We didn't have a you know, music service in the cloud, apart from BitTorrent, of course. Uh, we didn't have a lot of things that we have today. We didn't really have uh, autonomous driving. But our world isn't that much different you know, compared to 10 years. It's quite different, but not that much. Now think about the world in 20 years. Right? I mean, just look at all the stuff you already know today. Quantum computing, right? A machine with a million times the computing power. Yeah? 3D qubit computing. Right? 5G, 7G, 10G, unlimited connectivity. 10 billion people on the internet by 2030. Right? I mean, our world is going to be so different in 20 years, it's hard to even find science fiction about it. Right? I mean, the kids of my kids will live to be an average of 100 years old. They will never know how to drive a car because they just command it with their voice. Right? I mean, truly, that's huge difference. And the biggest difference is really is this, that the machines that we use today, like our smartphones, you know, these machines are your second brain. Right? For some of us, it's actually the first brain, because you know, like we do whatever it says. Right? Uh, but you know, it's like um, our dating is in here, our banking is in here, our email is in here, our content, our news, our DNA very soon. Everything is going to be in here. Right? And then this moves here. That's going to happen. Right? And then if Elon Musk has his way uh, directly here, the difference is in 20 years, we can change who we are as humans. That is the difference. You know, the steam engine didn't change what we are as humans, we just used it. Right? And the internet didn't change the way that we think, to some degree indirectly, but now can actually influence how we think. Look at social media. Right? Social media has changed the way that we live. 
not just get news, parenthesis. I, I'll talk more about that shortly. So that's a vast difference. And this is what's underpinning the whole thing. Yeah? Humanity and technology is kind of converging. In technical terms, you know, we're still very early. Most artificial intelligence machines, like Sophia, the robot from Hanson Robotics, they're as dumb as a toaster compared to us. Right? I mean, they have some sort of intelligence, but we're not quite there yet. You know, they're, they're pretending to be intelligent. Like Google Maps, you know, if you live in a city, wherever that may be, you will always question Google Maps, right? Because you're driving and say, no, 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 that can't be true. The machine is just stupid, right? But if you do it in a strange city, it's good. You know? So machines are kind of intelligent, but this is going to happen in the next 10 years. We're going to have machines that are actually matching us. We're going to start having conversations with machines. We already do, except that you have to speak like an imbecile, you know, like, hello, where is the restaurant? Right? You know, oh, okay. You definitely can't mix up any German English words like my own name, you know, like Siri Cortana has never actually learned my name yet, G E R D. That's like gastrointestinal reflux disease, same thing, right? It's not that hard to remember. Right? Siri hasn't learned my own name yet. So, I mean, those things are still in the early stage. But you can say in 10 years, convergence. In 20 years, anything you want it to be. You can change your human genome. You can avoid diabetes. You can live longer. 20, 30, 50 years, but not 500 years. So I would say that can be amazing. Or it can be terrible. Because, you know, this is what technology is. We have to make it amazing. That's what it comes down to. So this is a really, I mean, it's an important message that I speak about all the time. The biggest transformation in the history of humanity. You know, we had big transformations, you know, printing press, right? Yeah, the steam engine, World War II, the bomb, the internet, the mobile phone, the iPad, right? Parenthesis. But now we have this, right? All this stuff happening at the same time. Robotics, genome sequence, energy storage, I mean, 20 years? Science fiction is becoming science fact. And if you're a scientist, you're going to say, oh, my God, you know, that's, you know, California euphemism. Right? If you're an actual scientist, you know that not all of this is true, right, in terms of being exponential and so on. But, I mean, basically, we're seeing this happening right now. In five years, we're going to be able to speak to machines as if they were people in 30 languages. We're going to use WhatsApp to send voice messages in 100 languages in real-time translation. That's all on the, on, the, on the horizon. So, in the beginning, we basically augmented our muscles, you know, faster cars, airplanes, and so on. That's what technology did for us. And we're still doing that. Better airplanes, better vehicles, and so on. But now, we're going to augment our intelligence. This is a whole different ballgame. <laughs> And I think it's good as long as it's not like our intelligence, because our intelligence is very complex, you know, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, musical intelligence. Right? What kind of intelligence do, do, does a machine have? Computing intelligence, right? processing, but unlimited. Does it compare to our intelligence? I mean, your intelligence, if we meet somewhere, we wouldn't know each other from the stage or being here, right? 0 0.4 seconds for one human to identify the other human without saying a single word. Are you good or bad? Are you a potential mate? Are you whatever you are? 0 0.4 seconds, I got it figured out, right? And how is that? Well, that's called human intelligence. And of course, sometimes it's pretty stupid, of course, right? But still, that's what we have. So it's quite clear computers are binary for the time being until we have quantum computing. So zero ones, yes, no, yes, no. Humans are multinary. Which means any value at any given time, I can always change. And I can always come to a decision. I'm actually not at all like this. I mean, when you think about your husband or your wife, you don't go back to the, uh, the center of the brain and pull out the jetpack and say, aha, that's her, right? I mean, think about this, you know, when you think about something like San Francisco, immediately when I say that word, there's a million things in your mind what San Francisco is. And not all of that is data, like the size of the city or earthquakes or, you know, it's, it's like this. 
machines don't do that. Hence, I think it's a great pairing, right? We can never do what machines are doing as far as the logic and the facts is concerned. Today, we kind of can. Five years, 10 years, game over. Do not compete with the machines on logic and facts and knowledge. Yeah, that there's knowledge that is human, right? But knowledge of facts? I mean, you can speak to IBM Watson today and you can ask IBM Watson about the future of Switzerland. You get the facts in a nice voice. Right? So, what are we going to do about this? We're building stuff like this, the Internet of Things. Right? Very powerful tools. We can save 60% of energy here. We can invent entirely new things. And that's a huge global industry changing how we do it. Right? At the same time, when we think about this, you know, we're building sort of a nervous system. Right? Well, we're building something that's almost like our own nervous system. Right? When we do this, we're building this sort of meta-intelligence. Right? We've got to be responsible. We can't just say, you know what, we're going to build this just because we can, and then we worry about what it does later. Right? That's what we did with gas and oil and coal, the fossil fuel industry. Let's worry about, as long as we can drive the car, we're fine. We'll think about the rest later. We're building something that's going to have a trillions of connected devices. What are the rules? What about us? How can we survive as a human in this world? It could be amazing or it could be terrible. It could be like a, a total panopticon or it could be really liberating. So this is something we have to think about. I think, you know, the, what's called the Oppenheimer effect. You know, Oppenheimer was the guy who co-invented the nuclear bomb. He invented it because he didn't want the Germans to be first. He never thought the U.S. government would use it. But of course, they had different plans, right? They used it twice. And he felt like he had made, made it possible. He was really, really frustrated about this. Right? Now, when inventing all these things, we have to think about when we actually use it, what does it do? It's no longer enough to say, well, it's, we're going to invent anything we can, because in the, you know, in the very near future, we can invent anything. I'll show you in a second what that means, but bottom line is this, right? It's hell then. Hell and heaven. It could be heaven or it could be hell. Now we have to think about how do we make it heaven? How do we keep the magic without going to the manic? you know, the toxic. It's funny, the mobile phone is a great example. It's magic. And then some people are obsessed. They get manic. You know, they always have to do an update. And other ones are toxic. Like you put your phone on the table when you're having a conversation with your kids, changes the entire conversation. That's called poison. Right? Poisoning our relationships. But just because it can be poison, does it, does it mean I want to throw it away? When I drink a beer for dinner, does it mean I, I'm, I'm free to drink a bottle of brandy for breakfast? You know, I have to find a way to differentiate. This guy is using an exoskeleton to learn how to walk. He's a paraplegic. Took about two years of training and a million dollars. The guy could not move at all, and now is using the exoskeleton to walk again. And I would think, yeah, that's an amazing use of technology. If I can get a single person in the, in the universe or <laughs> on the globe to be healed or prevented, uh, not to get cancer, right? it's something we have to do. But on the flip side, we have this. Right? This guy, what's his name again? You, her. Right? He's, he's propagating that we should have the right to change ourselves regardless of being an accident victim or not, right? We can actually say, you know, my legs are not satisfying me. Let's get rid of them and buy other ones. Right? To which I would say, that's a little step too far because, you know, we're not talking about healing sick people here. We're talking about, you know, luxury sports saying, I'm going to rebuild my legs for two million pounds. You know? What is the difference? Well, it's the same technology. Right? What do you think is going to happen with uh, genetic engineering when it's possible to isolate the genome that's responsible for cancer or for, for diabetes. Is that going to cost a million pounds? So the rich people live forever and, you know, we don't? 
mean, those are issues that we have to look at. Elon Musk right, says that we need to upgrade ourselves so we can survive in the future. He says, basically, his argument is AI will be so powerful that if we're not also AI, right? So his project in Neuralace is a brain-computer interface that will get us to connect directly to the internet, which is already being used today for fighter jet pilots, and you know it's not totally new. But the idea of putting implants in your brain he said the other day he'd be the first one to do it if it was allowed. Right. Think about this for a second. Right. In terms of science, yeah, I would say eventually that's probably possible. Right? Is it a good idea? Is it something we should strive for? I mean, this would be the true merging of humans and machines. Right? You could not get out of bed anymore because your device isn't working. That's like Black Mirror, you know, times. 200, right? So here's a question I have for you. In this digital world, there's two things happening. One is humans are linear. You know, we are improving, but you know, we're not doubling like Moore's law. You know, humans aren't exponential. We're still organic. But technology is following Moore's law and Metcalf's law and you know other laws. Basically, technology has no limits. And this is our situation. We are linear. Technology is exponential. Nature is cyclical. Right? Nature goes up, everybody dies, it goes down, it comes back. Right? Dinosaurs, ice age. How are we going to survive in this world where technology is infinitely capable? Right? How do we harness it? So technology is exponential, we are linear. This is the question I have for you. Should we upgrade? Or should we respect the difference? Who's for upgrading? Anybody for upgrading? Come on, it's fine. I'm just going to vote perfunctory here. Right? OK. OK. I think a little bit of an upgrade is fine. You know, if you take a cholesterol medication or a statin or you, know, you have a uh, what you call a cochlear implant, right? that's kind of an upgrade. But it's a question of overall proportion, clearly. Right? And of course, you know, the business of upgrading would be a giant business. Now, imagine if this actually works. You know, who would not want to have it? So, is this our future? Right? I mean, uh, you think about technology. It's it's like literally. Uh, sometimes I say jokingly, God as a service. You know, uh, like like software as a service. We're becoming like superhuman, right? Right? omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. I mean, that is the promise of Silicon Valley, right? Why, why should we not transcend humanity? Well, the answer is, you know, to me, I fear that this is more of a downgrade than an upgrade. Right? Until I'm convinced otherwise, you know, I'd be very hesitant. I think certain upgrades, you know, if I had an accident, I would probably want to get another arm if I had to, right? But that's different than ordering another arm. So this is something we have to think about, which technology takes us, what we can actually do here, which way we're going. Because this question will really emerge, right? How do we retain our skills and our autonomy? If you live in Silicon Valley, people are saying, you know, what doesn't matter, privacy, you know? Come on, get over it. You're, you're like yesterday's guy, right? Uh, autonomy, come on, autonomy. Is, I mean, in this world, we don't have to be autonomous. We can be completely connected, right? To which I always say, no, if, if, uh, if you don't have anything to hide, you're probably not human. I mean, think about this, you know, this is, the, this is social media, right, basically. That's, that's what it has become. Right? Now, you have a guy who is immersed in technology, is sleeping in the Tesla. This made the rounds on the internet a little while ago. Right? That make me wonder, is this sort of a general thing to where we're like sleepwalking into technology? <laughs> and switching off. You know, in India, many, uh, many marriages are still arranged, about 71%. Right? Now there's an AI that does it. Right? It's partner.ai or something like that. But it's basically the, the family used to do that, and now they're using an AI to do it, to pick the ideal per partner for you. Right? So they have brokers and all that. But it turns out, actually, which is a funny statistic, most of those marriages are happier 
than the non-arranged ones, which is also a very strange statistic, uh, but debate there for later. But here's the key question for us. I mean, ultimately, when we have this, right, machines are telling us what to do, right? Machines are saying, no, you know, he doesn't want to do that, right? Some of that is funny, but imagine if we lived in a world where that would happen at every turn. Right? I mean, we would be unskilled, right? What's called the glass cockpit problem, you know, with the pilots where they can't fly anymore. So here's a short video that illustrates the point, hopefully in a funny way. Playing jazz. Playing jazz. Smoothie. Making smoothie. Calendar. No meetings today. Remember, dentist at 9.30. Fire off. Fire off. Open door. Door open. And we're going to do one more. Oh, yeah. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open. Open door. Repeat that. Open door. I didn't understand that. Hey, open door. Play on the floor. Sing on the floor. Ah, you get the point, you know. I spoke at the dentist convention yesterday, so I figured that was a good video. <laughs> but, okay, this, this, I mean, I'm sure we've been through similar situations, right? So how do we find the limits, you know? How can we not have too much of a good thing become a very bad thing? Should, should we prohibit all bad things? You know, I think we would agree, no. You know, smoking is bad, alcohol is bad, coffee is bad, you know, everything is bad in some way, right? Should we say, no, you can't have it at all? That would be stupid, right? I mean, in, in Germany, a 12-year-old can get a beer. Right? That's not legal, but it's possible, right? So how about technology? Should we say well, a four-year-old can't use the iPad, you know? It has proven to be bad for kids. It has proven too much screen usage is literally bad for your brain as kids. It's pretty straightforward in terms of what the science says. But what do we do about this? There we have to look at the financial rewards, right? I mean, the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, deep learning, right? You see this graph over here, basically shows quite clearly. Huh? We're talking about a $30 trillion value chain that comes out of AI and deep learning and machine learning. This is the biggest gold rush in the history of humanity. Right? I would say jokingly, replacing humans is the biggest business opportunity. But then I would say, hey, you know, if it's a, a great tool, I definitely want to have it. So who decides what the limits of that are? And of course, what we're seeing today, companies that do this are the richest companies in the world. The most powerful companies in the world are not the oil and gas companies or the banks or the military, right? They're these guys. The data companies, right? many of them are my clients. I'm quite familiar with the scenario there. And it's outrageous, right? So I'm saying, great. Now, obviously, we found something that works. Right? And if you look at, uh, at, in terms of investing, if you had invested in Facebook at the IPO, you would have made the most money in all digital stocks ever. Right? But now you look at Facebook from the other side, and you're saying, what has Facebook done that has not been as good as making money, right? I would say, you know, the list goes on from here to, to the parking lot, right? So how do we decide, you know? So here's what's happening with technology. This is something we have to ask, right? It's no longer this question about saying, okay, if this works or how it works or how much does it cost and how much money does it make? That question is finishing in, in the next five to seven years. It's not about this. It's about this question. Right? Why? Why are we doing this? And who is doing it? Because, you know, imagine in 10 years, pretty much, technology will be unlimitedly powerful. 20 years, it's hard to imagine. We can change the human genome, you can program yourself. You can use intelligent machines to do all the work for you, what do we do? I mean, basically the question is why? And how? And who? Not if. If you have kids, you got to think about this. What are our kids going to do in this kind of world? Uh, Ginny Rometty from IBM says, society gives each of us a license to operate. It's a question of whether society trusts you or not. This is the only key question. That's the only, because it's a human question, right? Trust is not a download. 
You know, trust is something that we create. We can break trust and make mistakes. We fix it. Right? But trust is not an algorithm. Right? I mean, how do you know when you meet somebody in the first second you can trust that person or not? Most of the time it's right. How do you know that? So this is a really important issue, I think, when it's about technology. And this is the key question for us, right? Are we going to live in this world where we're helping each other to lift? Or are we going to have opposing forces? And who's in charge? Who's mission control? We can't live without technology, of course, that's quite clear. I mean, even in the mountains of Switzerland, you know, where I live, not in the mountains, but in Switzerland, you know, it's hard to get away from technology. And the question really is one of what I call digital ethics. Right? Why is this a good thing? This is, by the way, the number one topic. 2019, Gardner says this is the one, number one topic for this year, is how technology can be kept good. Okay. Let's see how we define good, of course. Right? So here's our challenge, and it, it really is a great fit, you know, speaking about this under the Concord. Right? I mean, air travel is a significant polluter, right? and all of us, including myself, I'm the chief polluter, you know, in that way, because I'm always flying, right, to speak. Now I started doing carbon offsetting for a while, but nevertheless, right, technology has no ethics. We shouldn't expect it to. I mean, a computer has no values, it has no morals, it has no... I mean, if I tell the computer to make uh, paper clips out of you, it would set to work, right? Until uh, the mission is objective, is, is accomplished, right? I mean, that's what machines do. Why would we expect the machine to have, like, you know, Facebook system works? That's the scary part, right? It's not that it was hacked. Right? It worked as advertised, which is to manipulate. That's called advertising, right? That's the scary part. So let's define ethics. Uh, ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is the right thing to do. If you're a programmer or a startup person or a CEO of a company, what is the right thing to do? CEO of Salesforce says, Mark Benioff, Salesforce will not sell their software to companies that make guns. Salesforce has hired a chief ethics officer to determine the negative effects of what Salesforce does and to minimize them. Right. Now, this is like saying, I'm going to put sand in the gearbox, right? maybe sell less, right? but I have a better engine, but of course the sand doesn't make a better engine. Right? So this is like, it's a very big question. What would you do if you had a choice of making 10x or 1x depending on your ethical consideration. Google is in the middle of this the conversation. Right? Google, every month, you know, there's a major thing happening at Google where employees are saying, no, we shouldn't be selling this software to those people. Right? Like the Defense Department is using Google's AI. Right? And Google had to withdraw from the contract because Google employees were saying, no, this is not cool because it's going to end up in a drone that automatically kills people. Right? And these are very big questions that are going to be erupting all the way around us. Facebook example again, right? That's what Facebook does. Right? It's gunning at democracy. And is, is it doing it because Mark is evil? Well, probably not. Is, is it criminal? Right? Is it their intent? No. Right? But nevertheless, Facebook is facilitating. Right? Facebook is responsible on an ethical level. So, Stuart Russell, who writes a lot of really smart books about AI, you gotta read his latest book called Human Compatible. Uh, his first book is the number one book in the world on AI. It's used in all the universities. Uh, I think it's just called AI. Stuart Russell, UC Berkeley professor. So his book is Human Compatible. He says a social media meltdown results from optimizing the wrong objective on a global scale. This is an important statement, right? We're not saying that technology is bad or social media is bad. We're saying it's, it's optimizing the wrong objective, which is to keep people on the side. That's the wrong objective. Yeah. And that's generally true for technology. If your only objective is to make more money, to make a better uh, mousetrap for your customers, right, it will fail. And Facebook will fail spectacularly if they keep this up. 
So technology in many ways is a gift, right? Here's all the great technology that we have accumulated and then could also be a bomb. Well, that's not new, but now the magnitude is different. Right? I mean, think about a computer, maybe in 10 years, that has an IQ of a million. Yeah? I mean, IQ in the sense of computing. Right? You know, it's more to the IQ than computing. Right? Um, uh, Kurzweil says, Ray Kurzweil says, in 2050, we'll have a computer that has the capacity of all human brains. Yeah? Now, I could say that's fantastic. You know, going back to the first part, that's a present, right? I can use that, but how do I make sure it doesn't turn into a bomb? Right. So that's a question of governance and wisdom. And so I'll, let me play a couple of video clips here from people who have some thoughts on this. How do we build software that's secure by design, right? We had to really do a lot of re-engineering of our processes, teaching of our own engineers on what does it mean to do threat modeling in software so that we build more robust software. Same thing with AI. Uh, we have to have design principles. Any business, any person who's going to use AI to make any decision of consequence, your child's education, you are going to want to know and have transparency and explainability and trust in this technology. I will tell you there'll be no adoption of AI without that. And those of us who believe in technology's potential for good must not shrink from this moment. Now more than ever, as leaders of governments, as decision makers in business, and as citizens, we must ask ourselves a fundamental question. What kind of world do we want to live in? This is an interesting comment by somebody who runs the most successful company in the world. I think Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil company, is going public in a couple of weeks, and they're allegedly going to be bigger than Apple. Everybody else is smaller. <laughs> think about that for a second. Basically, what he's saying is that we have to question how we use technology. And as Satya from Microsoft is saying, we want to be regulated. I mean, I don't know if that's just lip syncing or, lip, you know, sort of greenwashing, right? But it comes down to this, right? We need guidance on this. So I have suggested that we should start forming digital ethics councils. You know, people who are not always saying, no, 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 we can't do this. That's stupid, right? This is not about ethics, right? But it's to understand the complexity of what we're doing. So in the meantime, we have that in Singapore. We have it uh, in Denmark. We have it, of course, all the companies are trying to set up their own council. I think we should do that here in Bristol. Right? Get a leg up on this idea of what is the right thing to do. Because you know, today, a lot of technology really isn't working that well, like speech recognition or AI. You know, it's not quite there yet, but it will be. Right? Then the question is, what do we want? Again, you know, Tim Cook says on this, and very important, right? technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. That's so true. This technology can do great things. It doesn't have any intent. Right? I mean, I can make 5,000 of these and you know, do all kinds of interesting things with technology, but what, what, is the, what do we want? Right? I mean, who's in charge of what we want? Not technology. And these days, if you listen to the stories about the future, who is telling the best stories about the future? Apart from myself, of course, just kidding. But who's, who's, who's telling the best stories, right? IBM, Microsoft. Huawei, right? the tech companies are telling us what our future is. That's not the way it should be. Because they're going to tell us a story that they can sell. It's good stories, you know, I'm not saying it's bad stories, but when you see Bob Dylan talking to IBM Watson, you know, it's impressive. But what is our own story? What do we want? So that has led me to a new theory, which I've been working on for the last couple of weeks. I think we should have a Hippocratic Oath, like doctors, for all technologies and technology companies. You know what a Hippocratic Oath is when the doctor says, I am going to do my work so I can do the best for people, irrespective of who they are and how they get here. Right? I want to use my abilities without a filter. Right? That's probably not, no longer the case, actually, in universities, but this was the discussion. So here's my Hippocratic Oath 
for technology. I will ensure that everything I invent, enable, provide, or sell is designed to further human flourishing. Now that is a heavy word, right? <laughs> human flourishing. Happiness, right? Human benefit. We'd have to fill that out with a couple of really hard facts. Right? We can do that later when we have a bunch of drinks. Right? But here's the interesting part. When you're looking at the current metrics of progress, and I'm sure you're all intimately involved in this map, right? This is the risks on the right and the benefit, right? So uh, negative consequences on the left, and this is the benefits on the lower scale, right? And where it gets interesting, as always, with these kind of business school slides, it's not from me, actually, it's from the World Economic Forum, but here, right? The top quadrant, the most benefit and the most risk, genome engineering and artificial intelligence. And does that mean we're not going to do any of this? I mean, that would be stupid, right? It's high risk, high reward. What do we do? Well, we create safeguards. We agree on a standard. Uh, we discuss how we can get, I mean, this is what we did with nuclear energy. You can have a nuclear reactor for energy today. Any country can have one. But you can't make a bomb. So we have to think about which way that's going. If you're looking at this chart, uh, this is from PricewaterhouseCoopers. I'm not going to explain this in detail, but you can download it later. I'll put this up on my website, futurewestguard.com. So all the risk, I mean, if you look at AI, it's basically a whole, like a, it's a huge amount of dif different kind of risk, security, performance, control, economic, societal. Right? We cannot just build something and then say, well, the risk or somebody else's problem. Let the government worry about unemployment. Let everybody else worry about inequality. In San Francisco, if you go there, you have inequality pure. I used to live there 17 years. Now you've got 8,500 8, homeless. And at the same time, last year, about 4,000 millionaires were created in San Francisco. Right? Who's going to worry about that? Right? Will the free market take care of that? I don't see that. That's something we have to think about. So let me talk about the risk a bit more, and then we'll go have some questions. World Economic Forum again says, okay, there's two major things today that are a risk for us. One, climate change and all the stuff associated with it. And of course, you heard about all that stuff in the news the last couple of months. It's really percolating now. Number two, the red one, technology. <laughs> Data fraud, cyber warfare, and so on. Zero in on this, Bristol, I read yesterday, the city council has decided that b diesel cars will be banned in Bristol. I don't know if you hear about this, right? But so it's a good move for Bristol. I think we should ban all cars. It's a different discussion. Right? But I mean, this, these are the things that are happening. So let's have a quick look at this, and then we can zero back to the technology. Climate change is now a number one topic, and it's very quickly become a number one topic. I've talked about it for 10 years, but you know, if you look at the stats, right? It's pretty obvious the stats are, yeah, they're not, they're, they don't make for light dinner conversation, right? So here, CO2, uh, China, US, the leaders in pollution. Right? And here, sheep, beef, and pork are the major causes of pollution as far as our food chain is concerned. And this map will really do you in if you want to have a nice day. Right? It basically shows you the entire southern hemisphere if we go up to four or five degrees in warming, as has been projected by the climate change panel of the UN, 50 years, right, the entire southern hemisphere becomes uninhabitable. 300 million climate refugees. I mean, talking about climate refugees and what we have now, I mean, this is chicken feed, right? So how do we solve this? Second thing is digital pollution. Same thing using technology that makes us strangers. You know, we have more relationships with our screens than we have with, uh, with other people. You know, we forget who we are, we forget our skills, we forget to talk to each other, we make love to robots. No, I don't know, not yet, but you know, some, yeah. So t those two things are our challenges, right? Climate emergency and human emergency. We're not quite at the human emergency yet, you know, we're, making our way towards this, but this is something we have to think about. Right? Now, if I scared you enough, let's go back here to the, to the topic of how, how we can solve the technical part. 
this is what we get in the cloud today. Right? We get content, we get conversation, we get community, we get convenience, very powerful stuff, and we get it provided by the large digital platforms in the world. These are the American ones and the Chinese ones. But all, what we also get is a kind of negative output. So these are the externalities. So addiction, bias, manipulation, tax avoidance. That comes out the other end. What we must now be doing is to say, we want that to happen on the front end so we can take advantage of it. But we have to address these issues. I mean, if, if technology is killing our democracy, well, what's the point of having it in the first place? Yeah. That's something we must look at. Right? So trust, accountability, responsibility, transparency, control, self-control, regulation. Yeah, big topics. I always say I think we need an EPA. You know what the EPA is, the, the Environmental Protection Agency. Or rather, I should say what it used to be before Trump killed it all. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency for Humanity. Do we need somebody that's going to say, you know what, this is actually not good for us? Or we could be doing this, but what if the cancer medication, the genomic treatment, costs a million dollars, and, and everybody does it that has a million dollars, everybody else dies? Right? Is that fair? Right? Would that be a reason for terrorism? Well, I clearly say yes. I mean, inequality is the number one reason for terrorism. So looking in this direction, yeah, do we need to protect this? I think the more that we connect, the more we must protect. It sounds like an, like, like an opposite, you know, like it can't be done at the same time, right? I think we need to rehumanize technology. And recently I've been talking about it so much that, that uh, this is not anti-technology, it's the opposite. We need to harness technology for human purposes. So lately, I've been calling this the new renaissance. You know, Florence in the 1500s, where the decision, well, you know, the whole debate was about saying, okay, our life is not about God, whatever that is, if you're religious, you know. Our life is actually about ourselves also. That was the bottom line of the renaissance. Right? And now we're here and we're saying, yeah, our life is about technology. Well, that's not true. Right? I'm not data, I'm not a machine. I'm not technology, my wife isn't an algorithm, you know, trust isn't a download, happiness is not an app. That's the new renaissance. And we have to use technology to make that happen. And that goes with the economic system. We have to think of a larger story, and this is happening now everywhere. I call this a quadruple bottom line, people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. Four objectives. I've been trying to get the Swiss government to build a new stock market where all the companies like Unilever, Patagonia, and others right, would list on this stock market that only has companies, what's called in the US a B Corp sometimes, right, go on this stock market to list, like the NASDAQ for good companies. Because right? there would not be much overlap between the two. Right? So I call this sustainable capitalism. Right? And I think when we talk about energy, when we talk about the future of technology, this is the winning horse. I think we see quite clearly, uh, also as far as climate is change is concerned, when we put this in the top, we have three objectives. Right? It has to be a holistic business model, not a one-sided model like Facebook. Right? Facebook is an exploitative model. Right? Turns us into fodder. Right? Circular economy, everything you put out, you take out, you put back in, and with the human focus. And now, for the first time in history, we have companies who are saying officially, this is what we are doing. Three weeks ago, the US roundtable, business roundtable, that's uh, 250 top CEOs in the US, declared that the future of the market is no longer about shareholder return, but stakeholder. Employees, partners, vendors, people, planet, profit. Right? And that's a very big step for American CEOs to say the top line of why we're doing stuff is not to make more money. Yeah, it may be, again, maybe just PR, right? Of course, nice PR, right? But a lot of companies are now going in this direction saying, what, how do we actually make this work? And I think ultimately that's where we're going. This is my mantra. I think the future for us is really 
awesome, awesome humans on top of amazing technology. And to be an awesome human doesn't mean you have to be a programmer to understand technology, but it certainly means you have to understand people. Our education is going to go upside down in the next 10 years. We're going to have a lot more humanities, ethics, understanding, culture, art, music, sports, and technology. If you have to make a choice, that's a tough one. But I would venture to say that in 10 years, if you are, uh, if you are understanding people, you're going to have a leg up. If you already are a technologist, this is the skills that you have to add to be powerful in the future. So I close with a statement from my book and this little animation. We have to embrace technology but not become it. There's a crucial difference. And I happen to think also this is a difference between cultures. You know, in the US we have a lot of culture about becoming technology, you know, transhumanism, singularity, as we have in China. Here in the UK and over there in Europe, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, we'll talk about that later. But we think about this and we're saying, you know what? We, we want to remain humans, really. Right? This is an important objective. We don't want to become machines just because we could become a machine. So I thank you for listening, and I think we're now going to have a short discussion with Paul. And thank you very much for listening.